SCCT would like to thank HeartFlow, provider of the HeartFlow FFRCT analysis, for its sponsorship of the Dona of Destiny podcast. Precision Heart Care is available to patients at hundreds of hospitals across the globe through the use of coronary CTA and the HeartFlow FFRCT analysis. All right, Alistair, so a CT scanner walks into a bar. Oh, no, not again. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, yes. So the CT scanner is in the bar, and the bartender goes, Gee, buddy, you look pretty burnt out. Have you put on some weight? Oh, Praveen, and, and what does the CT scanner say? So, so the scanner goes, I think it's my current diet. Must have put on too much mass. Do, do you get it? You got it current, current and mass, right? Okay, well, Praveen, that, that joke could certainly have had a lot more potential. Whoa, whoa. No. not bad at all, my friend, not bad. I'm absolutely terrified that you've wholly corrupted my sense of humor. What am uh, I doing? I could not be more proud. On to the podcast then. Okay, so let's do it. All right, listeners, welcome back to the Donut of Destiny, the podcast on all things cardiac CT for anyone interested in cardiovascular imaging. My name is Alastair Moss, and I am a cardiologist at the University of Leicester in the UK. And I am Praveen Ranganath with radiology at Massachusetts General Hospital in the United States. What's on the docket for today's episode, Praveen? So Alistair, today we will be exploring the science, history, and clinical utility of aortic valve calcium scoring by CT for patients with aortic stenosis. Severe aortic stenosis portends a significant risk of cardiovascular morbidity and death. Over the last two decades, the skyrocketing interest in TAVA in ever-growing populations has been paralleled by an increasing interest in characterizing the aortic valve using cardiac CT. And before we get into the imaging itself, let's talk about some pathophysiology first. So we understand the role of calcium in coronary atherosclerosis very well from decades worth of data. But how does calcium translate to a totally different disease process, aortic stenosis? Well, Praveen, aortic stenosis typically has uh, two phases, the initial phase and the propagation phase. Let's start with the initiation phase. It involves valvular injury and inflammation with accompanying lipid deposition and microcalcification, very similar to what happens in atherosclerosis. In the propagation phase, the valvular interstitia converts itself into an osteoblastic phenotype. Aha, hence the calcium. Precisely. The propagation phase is a vicious cycle where calcification begets more calcification. And I presume this underpins the idea behind the degree of valve calcification correlating with the severity of stenosis. That's right, Praveen. So although the major source of calcium in aortic stenosis differs from that in atherosclerosis, the same idea applies to predicting disease severity with CT calcium quantification. Right. The currently established method of aortic valve calcium scoring starts with a prospectively ECG-triggered non-contrast cardiac CT. That said, I'm sure our listeners are very familiar with the Agatston calcium scoring method that applies to both coronary and valvular calcium. For that reason, let's not dwell on the imaging acquisition technique. Rather, I do think we should spend a few moments on the technical nuances of how the aortic valve is identified for scoring on CT. Only leaflet and annular calcification are used to calculate the calcium score. However, valvular calcification often blends into adjacent aortic root walls, LBOT, the proximal coronary tree, and even the mitral annulus. And this leads to difficulties in separating out the valve on its own. At present, there is no widely accepted consensus or endorsed guideline on how to separate valvular from non-valvular calcium. A few common tips which may be useful for our listeners include using the multiplanar views to understand the spatial distribution of calcification. You should start in the center of the valve and work outwards and 
don't really sweat too much over the calcium burden when you've got a really high score. That's well said, Alistair. The multiplanar view, particularly an aortic valve plane short axis view, can be very helpful in differentiating valvular calcium from sinus and LVOT calcium. That said, the scoring process itself should happen on the axial images and not the multiplanar images. And I totally agree regarding high calcium burden. If the valve looks like a huge rock, a few extra accidental voxels of LVOT calcium won't meaningfully change the already sky-high calcium score. And Praveen, even with these potential pitfalls, the reproducibility of aortic valve calcium scoring is quite robust. Inter-observer variability is reported at around 5% and inter-scan variability around 8%. Those reproducibility metrics are right in line with, if not better than those reported for coronary calcium scoring. As much as we like to knock the Agustin method, it has stood the test of time as a reliable and reproducible technique for characterizing calcium. And I think that's a good segue into discussing the origins of aortic valve calcium scoring on CT. Yes, so publications in aortic valve calcium scoring started cropping up in the early 2000s. One of the first major forays was a 2004 ex vivo study from the Mayo Clinic. The investigators performed calcium scoring using electron beam CT on 30 explanted valves from patients who got surgery for aortic stenosis. The results showed a strong correlation between aortic valve calcium score on CT and calcium weight by pathology. This strong correlation has been confirmed with more recent similar studies using modern CT technology as well. The data showing a strong relationship between calcium on imaging and calcium pathology is all well and good, but what about the relationship between calcium score and clinical stenosis severity? That's what we're interested in, right? Right, right. So in the area of modern CT equipment, a notable advance in this came in 2011 from a single center study out of Paris in France. The study was aimed at finding a threshold calcium score that was predictive of severe aortic stenosis. The investigators first scanned 179 patients with aortic stenosis and normal ventricular function. This was done to establish an optimal threshold calcium score for severe versus non-severe stenosis. That ended up being around 1,600 arbitrary units. They then tested this 1600 threshold on a separate set of 49 patients with reduced ventricular function. This calcium score threshold correctly differentiated severe from non-severe aortic stenosis in all but three of these 49 patients. So overall, a pretty good start. And to validate these initial findings, there were two subsequent larger international registry studies that recruited over 1,700 patients with aortic stenosis from sites in Europe and in North America. In these two studies, the patients with severe stenosis had significantly higher calcium scores in the range of 2,000 to 3,000 Agustin units range. And that compared to patients with non-severe stenosis in the 500 to 1,000 range. The investigators then used these CTs to calculate an optimal threshold for calcium scoring. Wait, so did the investigators only calculate a single threshold calcium score regardless of the patient's gender? That's a great point, Praveen. We know that there are clear sex differences in the degree of valve calcification for a given stenosis severity. Namely, that women with severe aortic stenosis have lower absolute calcium scores than men. The investigators did calculate an optimal threshold for calcium scores to define severe aortic stenosis for men and women, and they did this separately. These thresholds ended up being around 1,300 Agustin units for women and 2,000 Agustin units for men. Interestingly, these thresholds were nearly identical between the two studies. And what do we know about outcomes in these patients based on valve calcium score? As expected, a higher aortic valve calcium score pretended worse outcomes. On multivariate analyses, calcium scores above that threshold showed higher all-cause mortality with hazard ratios ranging from 1.71 to 3.9. And this association is independent of echo parameters, demonstrating the incremental prognostic value of aortic valve calcium scoring. Okay, so 
While we may not need an aortic valve calcium score to diagnose severe aortic stenosis in patients with unequivocal echo data, this prognostic information from calcium scoring about outcomes is certainly helpful. Exactly right, Praveen. It's important to note here that the data we've discussed is for patients with concordant resting echocardiographic findings, meaning that all the echo-derived hemodynamics tell a coherent story of severe aortic stenosis. For example, the aortic valve area is less than a centimeter, the Vmax is greater than four meters per second, and the mean gradient is greater than 40 millimeters of mercury. But a common clinical dilemma is discordant echo data in patients with suspected severe aortic stenosis. And without getting too far into the hemodynamic weeds, resting echo can misrepresent one or all of the common echo parameters that are used in assessing aortic stenosis. And this can be seen with both low flow states and in normal flow states. The larger of the two registries that I referred to earlier specifically addresses calcium scores in around about 200 patients with discordant echocardiographic data. Compared to those with concordant data, the discordant ones have more heterogeneity in aortic valve calcium scores. Only half of these patients had scores above the severe threshold. That said, for those who had outcome data, the severe aortic calcium score threshold was an independent predictor of adverse outcomes with a hazard ratio of 3.3. So all in all, aortic valve calcium score can be very helpful in patients with suspected severe aortic stenosis and discordant echocardiographic data. These registry data that we've discussed are certainly very helpful in my mind. However, no randomized control trials have been performed to date assessing the impact of aortic valve calcium scoring. Thus, questions on the value of calcium scoring in appropriate selection for valve replacements and in post-intervention outcomes remain open-ended. Sure, Alistair, but evidence thus far has been compelling enough to lead to the inclusion of aortic valve calcium scoring in the 2017 ESC and 2020 ACC AHA valve disease guidelines. Specifically, in the ACC AHA guidelines, calcium scoring was given a class 2A level of evidence B and R for its use in suspected low flow, low gradient severe aortic stenosis with either normal or reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. That's great, Praveen. I think this has been a really nice overview of aortic valve calcium scoring. Definitely, but there is certainly a lot we weren't able to touch on in this episode. For example, we didn't talk about body surface area indexed calcium scores, uh, AI scoring tools, bicuspid valves, and calcium quantification on contrast enhanced studies. These are all good topics to investigate on future episodes of the podcast. And listeners, If you like what you hear from us, please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Once again, this has been the Donut of Destiny. Cheers. Thank you to our sponsor, HeartFlow, for their support of this podcast. HeartFlow is working to help clinicians across the globe recognize that coronary CTA is central to delivering precision heart care to patients. HeartFlow is revolutionizing precision heart care with the HeartFlow Analysis, a non-invasive personalized cardiac test that combines 30 years of human ingenuity and advanced technology. To learn more, visit www.heartflow.com.